It's that time again when Sandy Munro comes on this channel and blows my mind about something. But this time around, we're going to talk not about one, but five different topics, five different electric car technologies in 2021. And we're going to start right now. Welcome to E4 Electric, your number one source of electric car scoop. If you are interested in all of my conversations with Sandy Monroe, previous and upcoming, that's a good reason to hit that subscribe button and the bell notification icon so you don't miss anything moving forward. All right, so we're going to talk about five different topics, five different electric car technologies. Some are cutting edge that are just getting on the market this year and some have been around for a while, but I believe may need some refinement so it will be interesting to see what sandy thinks about those but before that a quick reminder that this video and this channel is sponsored by expong motors check out the p7 a beautiful electric sedan i just got to enjoy myself the other week it is equipped with x pilot 3.0 self-driving tech with navigation guided autonomous driving feature and even some cool games my full review is already posted. Check that out. And also check out Xpong Motors on Facebook. Both links are down below. Hey, Sandy, how are you? Uh, first of all, congratulations on that little thing that's hanging behind you, the uh, YouTube 100,000 <laughs> subscribers play button. Congratulations. Wow. Well, thank you so much. Um, we, uh, we, uh, we were very happy we could get that. Um, and between that and the uh, two million uh, people that have come to have a look at the uh, Elon Musk uh, interview, I mean, uh, we couldn't be happier with uh, with YouTube. So we're 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 golden right now. We're very happy about things going on. All right. So, well, uh, so today we're going kind of a we're going to do a, a lightning round. I'm going to throw some topics at you, mm -hmm. and we will uh, we'll talk about them. Um, so, and I wanted to start with something that I already know you're not going to agree with me. Most people don't, but I want to talk about the battery swap. As you know, um, you know, Neo in, in, uh, in China has a uh, 150 plus stations there to swap batteries. It is technically not technically. It is the fastest way to refill your battery. Um, Ample here in San Francisco just unveiled their technology, which is a little different. Um, I know you're not really a big fan, so tell me where am I going wrong where I'm thinking, hey, I can lease any size of a battery, I can change it, takes me less than five minutes to, to get a brand new fully charged battery. Where am I going wrong? Okay, so I traveled all the way across the United States twice, and um, <clears throat> I didn't need a battery swap, and I never spent much more than about 15 or 20 minutes ever. And most of the time when I jumped out of the car, I needed to uh, hit the restroom, I needed to buy a hot dog, and I needed to get back into the car in 10, 15 minutes, I was up to that 80%. At 80%, that's good for, uh, that's good for batteries. They, they don't like to be drained and they don't like to, they don't like to be uh, uh, charged to the max. So I don't see any reason for that. I also have a real problem, an even bigger problem with connectors. Connectors are the number one reason why uh, electronic stuff fails. So why would I want to pull out a battery, which is, means I'm going to have to disconnect a connector, and then put it back in, and how long before that connector fails? My battery is not going to fail, but my connectors will fail. They absolutely don't. In fact, the number one rule for, uh, for electronics is attach it, don't touch it again. And, and to me, Battery swapping is nothing more than, uh, hey, I got an idea. How do I screw up my car? So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna be on the on the side of battery swap. There's another thing too. I uh, I, I may have I may have mentioned this before, but I, I I have a barbecue right, and my barbecue requires a propane tank. I had a brand new propane tank, and um, and I went in and they said, oh, you can swap it right here. Oh, no kidding. So I bring my brand new prop and I look down and he's going to give me this rusted out piece of junk. Nope. That's all right. I'll go and have it filled up over here. I want mine to stay mine. I'm not interested in uh, sharing battery packs with anybody. So I'm not a fan. I will never be a fan. I think it's goofy and I... The sw only swapping is if we start talking about uh, hydrogen. And even then, I don't know, if at the end of the day, there's some solid state battery, or sorry, solid state 
um, hydrogen that we can utilize uh, that I, I'm really kind of interested in where I wouldn't have any, have any tanks and I wouldn't really be carrying raw hydrogen. I'm carrying disks that I can, uh, I can extract from. I like that idea. I'm not really a big fan of uh, battery swap. Sorry. Next question, please. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. Now, I do have to say that I think there are quite a few other, you know, I, I understand the mechanics. Obviously, anything that's going to be swapped out and bolted down every time is going to go wrong. But I'm just thinking from a consumer perspective, right? Uh, because like w one of the biggest things that I like about it is that, you know, I'm dragging this huge, let's say, 80 kilowatt hour battery with me when I only need 20 miles out of my car m most of the time. Uh, and I would prefer not to have, I, I only need 20 kilowatt hour battery most of the time. But when I do want to go across the country, when I'm brave, brave enough, <laughs> you know, I, I will go and swap it out to 100 or 150 kilowatt hour battery. So as a consumer, I like that, you know. Um, all right. All right. Well, I, I'll let you respond if you want to. Uh, it, it just, or you can just laugh at me. Okay, that's fine. No, no, I, I'm not laughing at you. I'm laughing with you. <laughs> okay. All right. I, I, I will move on to the next topic because I think okay, the next topic good. is actually fun. So, um, you know, we've kind of all kind of got to know this new company called Arrival. Uh, I know they're not the sexiest company out there. They make buses and, and vans, though they already have a, a 10,000 yeah. uh, van order from UPS. Kind of reminds me of the Rivian Amazon deal. But the way they make their vans and buses is very unique, right? They, they can convert a warehouse with a $50 million budget um, and, and, and turn out 1,000 buses or 10,000 vans uh, mm -hmm. in, in, a, in a year because they don't use paint. Their paint is built in, baked into their panels. They don't use welding. They use you know, adhesives and fasteners and bolts. Um, and they, they, you know, they go, they're going public, so it looks like it's, it's going to be successful. What are your thoughts on, uh, you know, micro factories specifically for Arrival, but just generally as a concept? Well, a long, long time ago, when Henry Ford uh, the first was running around, he had what he called uh, cottage factories. And uh, those cottage factories were built so that um, he didn't have to do as much shipping as what everybody else did. So what he did was um, he invented the KD, the knockdown. And so the knockdown fact, he would have things that were stamped and painted and whatnot. And then they would go to little boroughs or little towns. And in there, they would have a, um, a self-sufficient, like maybe an old, um, an old grist mill that would be using uh, water. And, um, and he would turn that into, um, into a, a, like a, a hydro, hydro as in water generating plant and then that would have enough power for the people inside to do what they needed to do in order to put a small car or a truck or something or a tractor together. So you ship the parts and then somebody else puts them together in a different part of the world. And uh, <clears throat> uh, they, were, they were kind of popular and they did the trick in the olden days. Um, now fast forward to uh, about um, maybe 10 years ago, another guy came up with a good idea. He decided that uh, South America could use some manufacturing. So what he did was he created a vehicle and um, with about a $50 million um, investment, he would ship you the parts and then you would put it together and he sold them to different areas inside of, um, inside of Argentina and Chile and um, Peru, different, different places. I, I'm not sure, maybe Colombia. Uh, anyway, it was a good idea. The only unfortunate part was that um, it, it wound up costing a little more money than what everybody thought. Uh, you're still shipping a bunch of bits and pieces, but sometimes the, all the pieces weren't there and slowed things down. Then you had to go and train the, the, the people to put them together properly. I mean, there is, these things aren't intuitive. You don't just start picking stuff up and putting it in place. Now, if this guy does decide to do, um, uh, to do this kind of work, then what you need to do is you need to have a good strategy, a, a strategy that's going to, um, going to allow you to be successful. And with that, um, there's, a, um, there's a, a video that we made a while ago about 
um, a light source uh, that, that can go down and identify the part, identify the tool, identify um, where the, the part's supposed to go and whatnot. And I actually put together something very complicated. The, um, I put together the, um, what do you call that thing? The electronics bay for the Tesla Model Y. And, um, and it, it, was, it was brilliantly easy with that, with that system. So if you're going to do that, I would suggest that that's one of the things that you're going to have to invest in, that type of, uh, that type of assembly aid. As far as having the parts pre-painted and stuff like that, it's too bad he just didn't go with um, maybe an, uh, a product that was plastic and, and came in in color. I, I'm not a fan of paint, as, as you probably know, or chrome or any of that other stuff. So uh, it would be great if someone could just... Um, uh, move that into plastic. Now, when you move to a plastic panel, um, you can make snap fits that uh, that are, you know, very rugged. A one-way snap fit is a good idea. And if you wanted to go one step further, well, then you could make it a one-way snap fit, and um, and you'd have adhesive that, as you put it together, it would burst a, a little capsule, and boom, now it's going to glue itself together over time. That that way, that works really, really well for me. I know that you can do this kind of a job. I'm not sure that, uh, I'm not really 100% sure that you'll be able to make as much money at it as what you think. But, um, I mean, what's old is new again. Let's, uh, let's see what happens. I know that there will be some, some downsides, but uh, I'm, I'm big on trying, trying new things. So let's see what happens. And, and by the way, the one good thing is it puts people to, to work in, in certain areas. So. That was one yeah, that part of their strategy. They're saying, you know, if, if you have a big factory, you have to hire so many workers. It's hard to find qualified workers in one area, but they only yeah. need about two or three hundred of them. And it's much easier to yeah. find really good talent. Yeah. And, and that's the, the whole reasoning behind um, Henry Ford. The first what he did was he wanted those uh, those factories because he felt that um, that he, diversifying the product would basically make it uh, easier and better. For the company in that one strike won't shut everything down and um, and the second thing was that um, people people that build the product would be more likely to buy the product and tell their friends to buy the product so there's a there's a there's a bunch of add-on effects there that that makes it uh, potentially anyway a good idea all right now let's move on to the next one and i don't think a lot of people think of the next item as a technology and i'm talking about the frunk the front trunk right but nevertheless uh you know there are some cars that are coming out even now like an id4 which i'm thinking about getting actually that somehow couldn't figure out how to get the frunk or you know the the new volvos they have a tiny little almost lunch box um you know talk a little bit about how easy or difficult it is to have a frunk uh, for the car, because obviously you have to still have air conditioning and other things. Secondly, there, mm. are, there is a motor sometimes up there as well for the two or three uh, motor vehicles. And also there is safety. And you know that's a very important part of the car to be safe uh, with the crumble zones and, and, and so forth. Uh, mm. Tell me a little bit about why some you know, cars have huge frunks like Lucid and Tesla and some don't at all. What's, what's involved? The only thing that's really involved is the engineering's profit. Um, when, you, there, um, when you design a car, the, everything is it's always the same. It's always about, um, about trade-offs. I want this, I'd like that, hmm, something has to suffer over here. So when you do these trade-offs, uh, the frunk is one of those um, areas of the car where you're going to say, do I want this or do I want that? Do I want my my air conditioning system to be up there? Do I want to have um, all, my, uh, all my electronics in one area? And, and quite frankly, the, the frunk is a nice to have. It isn't, I have to have it. Um, so that's, that's kind of how it would work. But for me, I uh, kind of like the Tesla Model 3 frunk. Um, it, um, uh, it is handy. When Corey and I went across the, uh, across the states, it made things quite, quite easy for us to have the frunk as, uh, as uh, the, the quick access, if you like, to, to uh, uh, carry product or, because we, we came prepared to go into cold weather testing, it didn't happen, but 
we came prepared and so that that takes up a lot of um, luggage uh, for that kind of thing um, so to me the frunk is a good idea we uh, actually have a product on the floor right now that we're working on and what we're trying to do is get smaller inverters because it's got wheel motors and we want to have smaller inverters uh, so that we can have a frunk that's of some size if we can do that and put them in the correct spot then we can have a bigger area for, for storage. And people love storage in any kind of a vehicle, whether it's ICE or EV or what have you, even aircraft, they, they want as much storage as they can get. So I think it's a good idea to try and do it, but everything's, uh, everything's based on making, uh, making choices. Does it at all jeopardize the safety? Obviously, you know, no. that's a pretty important part. No, no. Um, safety is designed in, uh, you don't, um, uh, it's not like a guess. So when you do the analysis on the vehicle, you do something called CAE, computer aided engineering. And when you do that, your simulation in, um, in well, in almost every material uh, you can think of, we have a modulus and we know how much it's gonna crush and we know what it's gonna look like even before you run it into a barrier or have a barrier run into you. So, um, that, that has nothing to do with safety. It's all in the hands of the engineer, all of it. All right, now next I wanna talk about what I think is the most exciting technology in the last 10 years yeah. for me as a consumer. And I'm talking about head-up displays, especially now that they're, you know, some of them are coming out with a augmented reality, which is just, you know, where stuff just appears in front of your eyes. Now, yeah. obviously there's a lot of software involved, though I'm not really sure how much. I feel like it's still pretty simple. But as far as hardware, to me, it looks like your cell phone projection thing that, that, that people do like when they watch movies on, on, on the wall. Um, am I wrong that head-up displays are more complicated? Because I don't see that many cars. I mean, Tesla doesn't even have one. Uh, I think Lucid may not have one. Yeah. Are they complicated? They're not complicated, but, but what turns into a problem is being able to see them. Um, because the, if you have the military ones, the one that's like an um, F-35 or F-22 or something like that, all pilots want to have heads up HUDs. And, um, and so, um, and they're used to them and they're made, they're made of exotic materials so that no matter whether it's bright sunshine or dark, you're going to be able to see what's going on. And they also have augmented reality. Uh, they want to let you know where your bogey is and things like that. So um, uh, they're not really difficult, but they are kind of expensive. And they do have issues, especially in a car where you're trying to save money or reduce the cost of things. And, um, and when you're doing that, um, a HUD turns into a luxury. Do I really need this? Is this going to be something that, um, that a customer is going to be willing to pay the extra money for and things like that? Um, but as far as, uh, as far as complexity and whatnot, no, it's not a really big deal. It's, uh, it's just another projector. Now, when we first got a hold of the Model 3, the first Model 3, um, I said, why don't they just go to a heads up display? And then we did a cost analysis and found out that the screen is much, much cheaper and people will like it better and you can see it better. So, um, we didn't, we never made a video on that. <laughs> It's tough when you, uh, when you say, and by the way, it's only going to cost, you know, X more money for something that's kind of inferior. But if we can go to something that's uh, a little closer to what we would find on an F-22 or an F-35 or an F-16 even, then F-18, I should say, then, then we're look. actually the F-16 has its own HUD system. The Israelis buy F-16s like there's no tomorrow. And they, they develop their own uh, HUD system, which is, uh, quite good. I have Very one good. in order myself, actually. It's just I got to get the f things figured out with my credit union. Otherwise, it's, it's going to be great. Oh. Yeah. 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 Uh, all right. So am I understanding you correctly? It, it, head up display is actually more, more expensive than having a regular flat screen display. Screen. Yes. What's, what's making it so expensive? They're just a projector. Projection. Part? Yeah. The, the, the bits and pieces that, uh, that go into the projection. Um, uh, there's a gazillion screens made. HUDs are in the uh, thousands. Um, so you're looking at, you're just looking at economy of scale. So that's kind of like what's happening here. 
All right, let's move on to the next one. And I know this one you can probably talk to, you know, about for a while. And it, it's been kind of controversial. For, I'm not really sure for, for whatever reason. But uh, let's talk about LiDAR as it's used for self-driving. I'm sure, yes, I know. But listen, I just, I, we all go, we all want to go home at the end of the day. So we can, okay, you know, right. we can, but, uh, you know, so, so uh, Xpon Motors, one of our sponsors, of course, I have to mention that, you know, they're just about to unveil the car. They'll have a, a, a LiDAR and it's going to be in production. Obviously, uh, companies like Waymo and pretty much everybody else uh, are using them for their self-driving tech that they're developing. Um, Tesla, you know, Elon said, we don't need that. As a matter of fact, he tweeted, you know, last month saying, um, you know, we're not even going to use radars. <laughs> Forget about LiDARs. Um, what's your... You know, and there are two things, of course, right? One, is it necessary? And two, are the prices coming down? Because, you know, Luminar is ready to sell them for under $500, which I think is pretty reasonable. What are your thoughts on that? My thoughts are that that's a technology that will be um, remembered as a footnote um, in history. I, uh, I think that, um, that um, FLIR dark matter technology a colorized FLIR with dark mantle, uh, dark, uh, dark, uh, dark energy uh, technology is probably going to take its place, and that's why Elon Musk is saying that. And the reason for that is because um, we do work in the auto industry, in the aircraft industry, and blah, blah, other kind of industry, but we also do work for the Department of Defense. And, um, and um, FLIRs, forward-looking infrared, are kind of popular. Um, because that's what we put on bombs, smart bullets. Um, believe it or not, we have bullets that guide themselves um, in the U.S. We have all kinds of cool things that are out there. And they have to be able to hit a target, and they have to be able to hit the target whether it's raining or snowing or foggy or anything else. And forward-looking infrared is kind of what is the popular choice. Now, everybody has seen um, night vision, right? You see things and you see this fuzzy orangish or reddish image and and you say ah that's that's forward-looking or that's infrared vision systems but it's not really really what people are working on is um is uh dark energy so everything even things that go down to ab absolute zero have some energy in them and that energy can be tapped and you can tap that energy and uh, and there's some very cool technology out there that's taking it and taking it from just this reddish blurry image and turning it into crystal clear color. <clears throat> that's what I want because FLIR is 3D. I can, um, I can make that work really, really well. I think LiDAR, um, I've, seen, um, I've seen images of LiDAR uh, from the people that we work with, the defense contractors, and it um, uh, I don't know what the right words would be, but if you had a disco ball or whatever, that's what your car looks like. And so the government ain't going to buy that. Uh, I don't think anybody in the Defense Department wants to have anything that looks like that uh, stuck to um, uh, stuck to the um, um, uh, stuck to any kind of a military vehicle. So they want something that's going to be um, accurate. They want something that won't give a big signature, and they're willing to spend a lot of money to get that. So that's where, that's where dark energy flares are, are taking over. And I believe that they'll be in the market in about a couple years, something like that, and they'll be cheaper than the $500. So uh, to me, uh, everybody keeps telling me, oh, LiDAR, LiDAR, and I keep saying, no, 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 I don't want it. I don't think it's, I think it's goofy, and I don't... Uh, Sorry. So you're saying neither LiDAR and maybe no radar is going to be on self-driving cars in the future. You're talking about the front-facing infrared uh, technology. Yes. Oh, yeah. I, 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 I've got to tell you, like, this is the first time I'm even finding out that it kind of exists and can be used in cars. So we'll, we'll, mm. we'll see. I mean, if you're right, I mean, I, 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 <gasps> this would if be... If I'm right, oh my. God, I'm, if I'm, I'm right. I'm oh, just saying, no. like, you know, if I if if people invest in the <laughs> stock, that that would be a good insight. That's you know, but okay, all right, that's awesome.
Yep. Well, thanks once again for, uh, you know, I have to say every time we, we talk and I have to go and do some soul searching and maybe some therapy because like, <laughs> you know, like, for example, like the battery swap, right? Like, I, th I think this is the best ever. Like, I'm so excited about battery swap and you just like, you just crushed my soul. So, all right, um, I will, I will. <laughs> I didn't mean to crush, I didn't mean to crush you. But at the end of the day, I still like you, even if you do like battery swap. I, uh, I think that it's, uh, it's never going to happen for any length of time. There's going to be a lot of things that are going to happen for a very short period of time, like HEVs. I, I, uh, I was talking to a bunch of reporters this morning, and he said, well, what about HEVs? And I said, there are going to be people five years from now that are going to wear, why did I do that? What was the rationale? What was, the, what poss what was I thinking? And, and actually, I'll tell you one other thing. Um, I said that what people need to do if they're going to try and figure out what the future is, go and ask a 15-year-old kid. Go ask him, what do you want? What do you want in life? And, and quite frankly, he's going to come back with answers that, um, uh, that are going to astound and amaze all the marketing people right now. They're going to be choking on shrimp and champagne uh, because it's going to be different when, than what they thought. And I'm telling you, battery swapping, no kid's going to want to do that. And um, HEVs, nobody kid, no kid's going to want to have that. They're going to want to have a really fast electric car that they can impress their girlfriend with, and they only want two seats. That's it. So Great. that's what's going to be in five years. Our future is in the hands of 15-year-olds. I'm, I'm exactly. even more depressed now. So on that, on that note, <laughs> before, yeah. Uh, on that note, I want to thank you once again. Congratulations on the thank on you. the uh, success of your YouTube channel. Uh, thank you. Thank uh, you so and uh, thank I will. Uh, I can't wait uh, to see how you're going to depress me the next time around. I'm here for you. <laughs> All right, I appreciate it, Sandy. <laughs> and of course, don't forget to subscribe to Sandy's channel. I put the link to it down below in the description of this video. All right, looking forward to all of your comments. Other than that, see you guys next time, and remember to stay charged.